Hello and welcome once again to Common Ground Church. We are so excited to have you join us today. My name is Nick and I head up the communications for the city of Cape Town with regards to Common Ground Church. I'm here with my good friend, Rosina. (laughs) Actually, that's a joke, guys. This is my wife. This is my wife. Can you believe it? Can you believe God's grace these days? This is my wife. I'm married to this beautiful woman. Not only that, guys. Turn sideways. Look at this. We're having a little baby. We're having a little baby girl, and she's coming in May. Early baby May. number two. Baby number two. We've got another little boy. He's just about to turn two. His name's Leo. So if you want to be praying for something, you can pray for uh, an easy labor for this little baby to come. All right. So why don't you tell uh, the people a bit about who you are and what you do? Because you also work here at Common Ground. Tell us a bit about what you do here. Yeah, that's right, Nick. My name is Rosina, as Nick said, and I work for Common Ground Constantiaburg. Um, which is really exciting. Common Ground Constantiaburg was one of the first um, plants out of Common Ground Rondebosch. And we've had the privilege of planting out of our church into South Peninsula. So yeah, we've been around for almost 10 years. We meet in Constantia. And probably one of the most defining factors of our um, congregation is that we are a congregation for all ages and stages of life. We have loads of families, loads of kids. And yeah, it's just a really awesome congregation to be a part of. That's right. So obviously, if you're joining us today, this is just a reminder, if you're already part of a different congregation in Common Ground, now's the right time to jump across to your guys' actual congregational channels, whether that's on Facebook or on YouTube, because each week your congregation will be doing something that is kind of a bit more tailored towards your community. However, if you're not a part of Common Ground Church, you're in the right place. So whether you are in the city of Cape Town already, Maybe you want to consider actually checking out what is the nearest congregation to me geographically. Maybe it is Constantiaburg, maybe it's Durbanville or Bloberg or Seapoint. We've got, we've got congregations all across the city of Cape Town. Find one that's maybe a bit closer to you. And maybe that could be a jumping off point for you to get plugged into a church in your community. Outside of that, you're in the right place. Enjoy it. You're so welcome here. So our mission here at Common Ground Church is to fill the city of Cape Town with the message, the life, and the fame of Jesus. And one of the ways that we go about doing this is by working alongside one of our partner organizations, Common Good. Z, don't you want to just tell us a bit more about what exactly it is that Common Good does? Sure. Common Good is a not-for-profit organization that was birthed out of Common Ground Church, and they seek to create opportunities for those that have been marginalized by poverty and injustice to help them realize their God-given potential and to mobilize the church to engage and act justly. They do this by focusing on three areas, early life, employment, and education to help individuals and communities across our city build better futures for themselves. So if you're interested in finding out more about Common Good or you'd like to get involved in some way, I really encourage you to check out their website, commongood.org.za. So right now we're going to be heading into a time of worship. And just before we do that, we're going to listen to a little portion of scripture to really get our hearts prepared and in the right place for meeting our God. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before Him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is He who made us and we are His. We are His people, the sheep of His pasture. Enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him and praise His name. For the Lord is good and His love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. Come, all you sinners, come find His mercy. Come to the table, He will satisfy. Taste of His goodness, find what you're looking for.
Father God, everything was created through you and for you. You created all things and you know all things. You know each and every one of our hearts, wherever we are now, in our homes, throughout the city. And so God, we ask that you would align our hearts with your will now. Jesus, that we would surrender our hearts to you as you work in us. We thank you that you love us. We thank you that you are with us now. And we just pray that you would do a deep work in our hearts as we hear from your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Right now, we are excited to be diving into week three of our Origin series. That's right. And the beauty of watching a message online is the ability to be able to share this message with friends and family, maybe even people that live overseas. So I'd really encourage you to think about who might benefit from hearing this message and either share it with them or simply tag them in the comments. Okay, great. Right now, we're going to hear the message. So settle in, get a notebook out, maybe get a pen. Feel free to take some notes. It just helps solidify the message in your mind. And uh, we're going to hear from our speaker today. Hello, everyone. My name is Kyle. I'm married to Michelle. Uh, we're part of the leadership team at Common Ground in Seapoint. And uh, we've got a, a one-year-old boy called Harrison who is lots of fun right now. He is crawling around and creating lots of havoc. But um, welcome to week three of our origin series, where we are uh, going back to the beginning and exploring the big questions of life, all from the first three chapters of the Bible, Genesis 1, 2, and 3. And so far, we've looked at the fact that God created everything. He created everything out of nothing. He created the universe. And then what he did was he started to form it and fill it and prepare it for the climax of his creation, which is us, human beings. And that's what we're going to explore today as we look at the origin of humans. Okay, how do we fit into the story? Because actually, we're not the main characters in this story. God is. And in Genesis 1, uh, we come on the scene and we're told quite explicitly, actually, what we are to do, what we're here for. And maybe a helpful way to come at this topic, this conversation for anyone who's listening today, and maybe when you're engaging in conversations with other people, is to ask this question, what is the meaning of life? What is the meaning of life? What is the purpose of human beings on this planet? The meaning of life is dot, dot, dot. Fill in the blank. What would, what would you say? If you're with us today and you're exploring God Jesus, faith, you're exploring this question, what is the meaning of life? Um, I want to say you're so welcome. I'm so glad you're here. And you're invited to listen in, lean in, and hear what we believe and hear what the Bible has to say uh, when it comes to answering this question. And I think it's a very helpful question for all of us to be asking right now, um, especially in this coronavirus season, because across the globe, there are lots of things that uh, we could make the meaning of life. Okay, we could make career, health, Family, achievement, success, the meaning of life. I would say people have made these things the meaning of life for decades and centuries. And right now, COVID is humbling us. And COVID is, is revealing uh, the fact that if you make these things the most important thing in life, if you make these things, health, family, career, whatever it is, if you make these things the meaning of life, then you can actually lose the meaning of life. And I would say that that is a very dangerous thing when life loses its meaning, when humans lose the purpose to live, when we uh, lose the drive to live, where there seems to be like there's no uh, point to anything. When you can choose to give something meaning and it can be removed through death and sickness and economic upheaval or betrayal or injury or sickness, that's a very, very dangerous thing. Now, don't get me wrong. I want to say this clearly. The purpose of life is not detached from relationships. It's not detached from using your mind, using your brain, creating things, achieving things, labor. It includes all those things, but it's also much more than that. And that's what we get to explore today. And so here's the plan. This is where we're going for the rest of this message. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually put forth a proposal. Um, I'm going to put Put, put to you what I think the Bible says is the meaning of life, the purpose of life. And then we're going to go and make the case for that. We're going to look at Genesis 1 and 2, and we're going to make the case for the proposal that we put forth. And then after that, we're going to explore 
what I think is the problem, what the Bible says is the problem that we face as human beings in trying to achieve our purpose and where we go wrong. So that's the plan, that's the roadmap. So let's get into it. Let me start with the proposal. The proposal, let me put forward here um, an acronym that I think will help us. And uh, an acronym is basically when you, you see all those letters on the sides. It's a very old school teaching technique and it is a little pithy, but I think it's gonna uh, help us all remember what we are um, hopefully trying to retain today. And so um, it's the word biology, and it's a, it's a perfect word for this because um, bios is the Greek word for life, and logos is the Greek word for meaning or the reason for. And so there we have the reason for life in, in the word biology there. And let me start here and say, if there is a creator God, which we believe, which we have established over the last two weeks, if there is a creator God, he is going to have a lot to do with the meaning of life, okay? The, the purpose of everything is going to be bound up and, and found in him and in relation to him. And if you think of the creations of galaxies and the beauty of a sunset or the complexity of the human eye, we've already said that there is something extravagant about this God who would have made this stuff and gone to these great details to create sunsets on planets that no human eye will ever see. There's something extravagant about that. And so if we believe in this God, this creator God that the Bible is revealing to us in these early chapters, as I say, the purpose of life is going to have an awful lot to do with him and living for his glory and putting his glory and his majesty and his amazingness on display. And so definitely living for the glory of Yahweh is going to be a huge part of this. And Yahweh is simply the Hebrew name for the God of the Bible. It's actually revealed for the first time in Genesis chapter 2. So living for the glory of Yahweh is going to be the the end goal, ultimately, of what life is all about. But how do we do that? Okay, that's the question I think we, we then really have to answer and, and get to grips with. How do we do this? What does it actually look like? What are we actually supposed to do so that this doesn't just sound like some sort of ethereal thing that we don't know how to um, join dots to? And I don't know if you're like me, but I think there's many of us in this world who um, sometimes think or maybe even sometimes worry about missing the point of life. Maybe you, you, you have moments where you, you or, or you, or you hope you don't get to a moment where you realize there was something you were meant to do with your life and you've completely missed it. I think that's quite a common uh, human thing. And so if this is a, a worry of ours, if we, do, don't, if, if we don't want to miss the purpose of life, then it's important to actually have an accurate understanding of what we're meant to be doing here. What are, the, what are the concrete things that we know we're meant to be going about doing? What is the meaning of a human life? How do we accomplish the glory of God, which is the end of all things? And there are four things that God uh, reveals to us here in the opening two chapters of Genesis that help us understand what we're meant to be doing with our lives. You could maybe boil these things down to two, but I think they're quite helpful keeping them as four, and it's going to be really helpful in, in uh, filling out our, our acronym here. And the moment you start hearing these, some of you might think straight away, well, that doesn't sound very spiritual. That doesn't sound very worshipful, you know, if we're meant to be bringing uh, glory to Yahweh. But I want to say to you that everything you're going to hear coming up next is spiritual, okay? As I say, worship is the purpose of life, but worship involves our whole lives. Worship is not just singing. And sometimes um, those of us who have been in church for a while, or maybe if you have visited a church, um, you might just define worship as singing, but it's so much more than that. It involves everything we do. We bring glory to God by doing very ordinary things. And so the first thing we're meant to be doing and bringing about in this world is beauty. And we're gonna unpack these all uh, very shortly when we come back around and make the case for this. But the first thing we're meant to be doing and creating in our world is beauty. That's the first thing. The second is the image of God. Okay, you and I are called to create and conform human beings to the image of God, okay? The world is meant to be filled with little people that look like their creator. That's what images are. They are representatives of God. And this is not only about having babies. It includes having babies, but it's so much more than that that we'll see a bit later. Beauty, image. Next is order, okay? We're meant to be bringing about order and structure and definition, and this might really sound strange, but if you think about it, it is a major feature of human life. Just think about it for a purpose. This is, uh, for a moment, this is why we work. This is what we are doing when we are working, whether it's with spreadsheets or uh, the raw materials of the earth. We are bringing about 
order. And it'll become uh, more clear when we look at the text shortly. But also I want to say that work is not just paid employment. Work is not just paid employment. And I'll make the case for that shortly. Beauty, image, order, and life. That's the last one. Okay, God doesn't want nothingness. God doesn't want an empty world. We are meant to be bringing forth life into this world. And all of this is meant to go to the ends of the earth so that it overflows with the glory of God. So we're meant to be bringing about beauty, image, order, life that is overflowing to the glory of Yahweh. That's the, that's the, the proposal that I wanna put before you today, that this is the meaning of life. This is what it means to be a human. This is what we're meant to be going about doing. So now what I want to do is I want to make the case for this from the Bible because I don't want you to, to, to see the word biology there and just think, oh, that's a great idea. No, no, no. Is this, is this biblical? Does this come from the pages of Scripture? So come with me now as we make the case. We're going to go right again to the beginning of the Bible, Genesis 1, uh, verse 2. So Genesis 1, verse 1 kicks off and says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then verse 2 says this. It says, The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. What you'll notice here is that God didn't create the world perfect off the bat. And what I mean by that is um, it wasn't complete. It wasn't broken, but there was still more work to be done. There was still stuff to happen. There were still improvements that would be made. It was incomplete. So he created the heavens and the earth. He created the skies and the land. That's what that means. And it was without form and void. And the Hebrew words here for this are tohu and bohu. So the phrase is tohu wabohu, formless and void. Uh, some translations could say wild and waste, but it means that there was no structure or order and it was without life and it was empty. Now, I wanna give you a little example of this. I have brought here Harrison's crate. Now, Harrison's crate sounds like a scientific experiment or hypothesis, but actually I quite literally mean my one-year-old's crate. This is Harrison's crate. He stores toys, uh, and fluffy animals in here. This is his crate. Um, but it, ne- it, it can't do much right now when it's not assembled. It doesn't have any structure and clearly it's not holding anything. What needs to happen with this is that it needs to get structure put into it. It needs to be formed. So we do that and we pull these sides here and now it has structure, okay? It has order, it has definition. And now Harrison can come and he can fill it with his Star Wars toys or whatever he's got, and then he can get enjoyment out of it. He can get so much purpose and life and meaning out of this little crate. This crate, when it's not assembled, when it's flat, is tohu or bohu. It is formless and void. And I want you to have that image in your head because that's the way the world was created, right at the beginning, tohu or bohu. And then God came and he formed it and he filled it. And we spoke a bit about this last week. He brings structure and then he brings life. And in the first three days, he forms and he brings order out of the chaos. Okay, so he separates light from dark. He separates uh, the waters uh, below from the waters above. And then he separates the land from the sea. And then in the second three days of creation, he fills it. He fills the sky with stars, the the heavenly bodies. He fills the sky and the sea with fish and birds. And then he fills the land on the sixth day with animals and then humans. The whole of of Genesis 1 is structured around this phrase, tohu wabohu, these two words. And God then creates humans in his image. And he basically says to us, now I want you to have the same role. I want you to continue doing what? what I have done. The rhythm of the song has started. Now keep making music, essentially. That's what God has told us to do. And being created in the image of God means that we represent him and we carry on what God was doing. We are like him. We're created in his likeness and we represent him. God wants us to continue working on his behalf. Essentially, I like to say it like this. We are basically middle management. We are vice regents ruling and reigning and continuing God's work on his behalf. We are to bring order and life and beauty and the image of God to this world, to this cosmos. And that's exactly what God commissions us and mandates us to do in Genesis 1.28. So it says this, And God blessed them, that's the humans, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And right here in in Genesis 1, the context was pretty simple and narrow. Have sex, have babies, and fill the earth with people who look like God, little representatives of God. 
and then subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. That is about bringing dominion and order and organization to the world. And this is what your role is as a human being. You as a human being are the solution to tohu wabohu. You are the solution to the formlessness and the voidness of this world. And with this in mind, I want to now bounce us to chapter 2, Genesis 2. And we're going to read quite a lengthy passage now, Genesis 2, verse 4 to 17. So read with me. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created, in the day that the Lord God, Yahweh God, made the, heaven, the earth and the heavens. Where no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground. And a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden, in the east. And there he put the man whom he formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden and there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is the Pishon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Havilah where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. Bedlam and onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is the Gihon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Cush. And the name of the third river is the Tigris, which flowed east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man, put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it, to serve it and guard it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in that day that you eat of it, you shall surely die." Now, Genesis chapter 2 compared to chapter 1, you can see that it's, it's very much anchored in history. It's very much anchored in geography. It's a far more specific telling of the creation of the world and the creation of human beings compared to Genesis 1, which is far more high level. And we've got here a world again being created. It's formless and void. God brings order and structure as he forms it. He then fills it. He brings life. And he calls human beings to govern this creation, to bring beauty, image, order, and life everywhere that the earth might be filled with the glory of God. And he says, you see here, he makes a garden. Okay, and this garden is beautiful. God has sculpted it and landscaped it. He's ordered it. It's not, it's not a wilderness. It's not tohu. It's not wild. It has boundaries that we can see there, the rivers. It's beautifully landscaped. And then he puts the human being into it. He puts Adam into it. And that, 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 that human bears the image and likeness of God, the image and life of God. And into beauty comes the image of God. Into the order comes life, overflowing to the glory of God. It's biology again. again. Beauty, image, order, life, overflowing to the glory of God. And the garden here in Eden is where God lives. It's in a sense his dwelling place. It's the place where heaven and earth meet, where God's realm and our realm meet. This is the first temple, theologians like to say. Okay? If you go look at the later temple, you'll see that it's full of garden imagery pointing back to Eden. Okay, when you uh, entered Eden, it was when, you, when you walked into this place, it was the first place where you would be in the complete manifest presence of God, the direct presence of God Almighty. Okay, Eden was the sanctuary in the wilderness. It's a beautiful image. It's the place of beauty in the middle of the rest of creation. And this garden, it's not a small little patch uh, of vegetables in your backyard or I live in a flat. It's not the little tiny little box that I hang in my balcony that has a few plants in it. No, it's massive. I mean, just read the descriptions, okay? Um, two of the rivers that are spoken about here are still in existence in the Middle East. This place is huge. It's, it's probably more like a national park, to be honest. So in your mind, rather think like Kruger National Park than, than, than your backyard, and the glorious thing about that is God says to Adam, this is yours. Have the run of the whole place. Go and, go and do your thing. Go and, go and get about 
getting on with your calling. It's yours. It's filled with beauty and order and life and the image of God. And God calls Adam to go and extend that garden, extend the boundaries to the ends of the earth. That's the call upon humanity. Go into all the earth, spread the image and beauty of God everywhere. That is what we are here to do. This is the meaning of life. And if you just step back for a second and think about it, it's, it's kind of obvious when you, when you consider it. Okay? These two activities are still the foundation of human behavior, work and family. No matter what culture, no matter what creed, we still are getting about these two things that God set up at the beginning that we are called to do here. Okay, most of us spend the majority of our lives involved in these things, no matter who you are. Even if you don't have a family of your own as a parent or a spouse, you are part of a family. You've come from a family. And most of us, if not all of us, are working almost all of the time. These are the things that give us meaning. They unite us in many ways as humanity. They're the things that give us a lot of meaning and purpose and joy. And they're also the things that we often idolize and put on a massive pedestal at the same time. But we are involved in bringing beauty and order through work and life and the image of God through family. Whether you're Christian or not, whether you're Christian or not, this is what humans do. Okay, animals don't do this. Animals don't do this. Especially animals don't do this for the glory of God and, and the well-being of all creation. It's, a, it's an amazing privilege that, that we've been given as, as image bearers to do this stuff. So work, think about it. Work is about transforming formless tohu into something that has order and structure and definition. As I said earlier, whether it's spreadsheets or uh, wood or brick, whatever it is, it's about bringing order out of chaos. And family is about turning lifeless bohu into something that is full of life and the image of God. Again, I'm going to keep hitting it home. This is the meaning of life. This is what you were put on this earth to go about doing. And as I mentioned earlier, um, work is more than just paid employment. Okay, you go back and look at the text. Adam didn't get a salary after a week or after a month. Okay, work is about bringing order and beauty for the flourishing of everyone. But there are some people who don't get paid for their work, and yet they do much more work than those who do get paid. Okay, I think right now of stay-at-home moms. I think of my wife, Michelle. She is right now currently at home, uh, not getting paid for looking after Harrison but, Harrison, but she is bringing order out of chaos right now. Harrison's, his, one of his favorite things to do right now is to go and take the toilet paper, tear it up, and leave it all over the house. He basically creates snow all over the house. And, and we are involved in bringing order out of chaos right there. We bring structure, and at the same time, hopefully life out of that. But I also want to say that retirement doesn't mean the end of work. You might, you might stop getting paid for your job at that age, but you, you still have a calling. Those of you who are nearing retirement or who are in retirement, you still have a calling to bring order and flourishing in this world, to bring structure, to bring order out of the chaos. You still have that calling to go about work in your communities, in your families, in your home. And similarly, family, I want to say, is not just limited to getting married, and having kids. And I really want to underscore this, and I want people to hear this. Everyone, single people and married people, that, that having babies and having children is not the full extent of bringing life and the image of God. Scriptures actually say that single people are even better than married people at bringing people into the family of God. Okay? Married people, they have children by giving birth, but we can all be involved and helping people be born again and bringing new spiritual life into people's lives. The family of God is the true ultimate family and we are called to bring people into that family and conform them to the image of Jesus. And single people have a unique capacity for this. It is true. Paul speaks about it in the scriptures. And Isaiah the prophet has a beautiful thing to say. Isaiah the prophet says that um, the barren woman, the childless woman, she actually will have even more children than the married woman. It's this prophecy and this, this picture of the fact that there can be life and meaning and image birthed forth from single people in this world when they get about causing human beings to come home to their creator and be conformed to the image and likeness of God by making disciples. It's a huge, huge calling. Okay, Isaiah speaks of uh, eunuchs, 
again later. Okay, eunuchs are people who could not have children. And he says eunuchs in the kingdom will have better names than sons and daughters in the kingdom of God. So bringing the image and life of God does not depend on getting married and having children. And the Apostle Paul is just a fantastic example of this. You just go look at his life. Go and read the book of Acts and look at his letters and see how he brought about life and the image of God through his life. So, if this is all true, okay, if all of this is true, if this is the purpose of life, a logical question to ask here is, why do so many people seem unfulfilled? Why do some people still feel like their life is meaningless? What hope might we offer people who feel like this? Maybe you from time to time feel like this. What do we say when people say life is meaningless? Or maybe right now they've realized that the meaning of their life that they've created is threatened by coronavirus or threatened by economic upheaval. Well, it, we need to diagnose the problem in order to answer that. So what is the problem? Why do we feel unfulfilled? And we'll, uh, we'll bring forth a, a fuller explanation of this as the series progresses, as we get to Genesis 3 in particular. But it's linked to the tree in Genesis 2 here. So we read earlier, The Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And we know this as human beings. You can have sex, you can have children, you can administer governments, you can create amazing art, you can fly to the moon and back and not be fulfilled. Why? Because you are actually attempting to bring glory to yourself and not to Yahweh. That's the big idea of, of what's being said here in the passage. That's exactly what Adam and Eve did in the next chapter, okay? And most people in the world are doing this right now, seeking to glorify themselves rather than God. And if we miss glorifying God, we are going to miss our purpose and life is going to start to feel meaningless because we've missed the main reason where we were created, the end of all things, the glory, the glory of Yahweh. And when people read Genesis 2 and Genesis 3 and we consider uh, the tree here, a lot of people struggle with this tree. A lot of people have um, issues with it and, and uh, genuine questions arise. Okay, Why would God put this tree in the garden? Why would God do this? Why would God ruin this amazing garden by putting this little death trap in there? Okay, why does there seem to be this random keep off the grass sign? Or maybe some of you are thinking, you know, this random keep off the beach sign. Why is this there? It sounds petty in many ways. A lot of us see the command of the tree like this. If you do see it like that, it's going to obviously then affect the way you think of God. And so it's important to think rightly about this tree and this prohibition here that God has put in the garden. And I want to put before you that there are three types of bans or prohibitions in this world. You've got three options, legal, consequential, and relational. And a legal ban is simply this. It's, it's where we say, okay, here is a rule, and I have more power than you, and so I'm enforcing this rule, and I'm telling you what you can do and what you can't do. And if you do the things that we've told you that you can't do, then bad things are going to happen. We are going to enforce punishment uh, upon you as a consequence. And this is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, most laws in our country work like this. So that's the first thing. It's a, it's, it's, it's a legal ban. The next is the consequential ban. The consequential ban, it's, it's from having consequential rules, okay? And it would be, for example, don't do this because if you do this, something bad will happen as a result of this. So for example, with my son, Harrison, do not put your finger in the plug socket. Why? Because if you do, you will get electrocuted, your hair will stand on end, and it's not going to be a pleasant moment. There's a consequence to your action. It's directly related to your action. Therefore, the rule is in place. Do not do that. Don't feed the lions, for example. And there's, many, there's many examples that you could put in here, but they're not arbitrary. They're actually trying to protect you. The consequential rule is trying to protect you. And that's part of what's going on here, I'd say, in Genesis 2. But over and above this, what's definitely happening here in Genesis 2 is the last one. The relational rule, the relational ban, maybe you could say. It's a rule that you keep because you desperately want to avoid hurting the other person, whoever that might be. Okay? Your relationship will suffer if you don't keep this rule. So in a marriage, for example, it could be something like this. Uh, there might be one partner in the marriage who has a habit of biting their nails. 
I don't know if this is a thing in your marriage. I'm not saying it's a thing in my marriage, but maybe one of the partners in the marriage has a thing of biting their nails and then leaving the pieces of nails on their iPad, just kind of around, maybe on the laptop, on the counter. Now, a rule might come in place from the other spouse that says, please do not bite your nails and leave them around the house. It is not good for our relationship. And so out of love for wanting to keep this relationship healthy, the one spouse, whichever they might be, I don't know who that is, they would stop biting their nails and leaving them around. They would either stop biting them completely or they'd put the nails in the bin or the toilet or wherever that might be. Now, that's a very trivial example. That's a very trivial example, but it kind of makes the point. But here's a more serious example. It would be a rule like this. In a marriage, for example, don't sleep with someone else. Don't sleep with someone else. Sleeping with someone else in itself is not going to cause death. In itself is not going to cause divorce but it will cause hurt that then can lead to a whole bunch of other things. And so when we come to the tree in the Garden of Eden, it's not about the tree. It's not a petty rule, just do not eat the tree. No, no, no. Remember, God loves trees. He created this massive garden. There's a whole other tree which is really good, the tree of life. So God is not against trees. No, God was about saying this. God was saying, don't eat of this tree because I don't want you to know what evil is like. And that'll break my heart if you do. There'll be some consequences too. But the highest reason is it's going to break my heart. What's happening here is the temptation put before Adam and Eve in the garden is kind of like the temptation before man where they say, well, I want the knowledge of what it's like to sleep with that woman as well as my wife. That's that's what's going on here. And Luke Harper from South Penn reminded me this week, um, actually, the, the the prominent metaphor in the Bible for the breakdown of the relationship between God and his people is that of an unfaithful spouse. So I think it's a very appropriate sort of image to talk about what is happening here in the garden. Now we are meant, we are here to glorify Yahweh, but what we've done is through our own selfishness and our own passion to glorify ourselves, we have wrecked that, we have destroyed that relationship and we have unleashed havoc on the whole of the earth. And basically, ever since, here, ever since then, Genesis 3, ever since Adam and Eve gripped that fruit and said, no, we want the knowledge of good and evil, ever since they've done that, we've been walking around as human beings and we've been asking questions like, what is wrong? What is wrong with this world? Why is there suffering? Why don't I feel fulfilled? Why do I just feel like I'm on this treadmill consistently? Or we've looked around and we've said, how can we improve this world? Because it is broken. We've asked all those questions since then. And we're fortunate enough not to just be left in that situation. Right from the beginning, right from Genesis 3, God said, no, 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 I'm, I've got a plan. I'm gonna set forth a plan in motion. Why? Because I, God, wanna come and I wanna make things right. That's the heart of God, to restore. I want to restore what has gone wrong. I want to return order and beauty to the earth that I lovingly fashioned. And that was, that, that was set about right at Genesis 3 and it climaxed 2,000 years ago when God said, I am coming to this earth as a Jewish carpenter called Jesus of Nazareth. Okay, and where Adam right at the beginning was placed in the garden to face temptation, Jesus said, no, I went out into the wilderness to face temptation. And I became ugly so that you humans can be, become beautiful again. Okay, where Adam took from the tree the fruit that he wasn't meant to take, I, Jesus, was hung up on a tree on your behalf and punished on your behalf. I come as the image of the invisible God to to show you who God is, to show you what God is like. And then I sent my spirit to conform you to the image of God, to transform you, to make you the beautiful image of God, to, to restore the life of God to your world, to the people around you. This is the good news. This is the good news of the Bible. We call it the gospel. And it is a mind-blowing gospel. It is amazing that God set this rescue mission in action and it has been completely successful. It has been 100% successful. We now are living in the, the restoration of the whole creation because of what Jesus Christ did when he died on the cross and he rose again on our behalf. It is amazing. And what you do, when you, we've been in the first three chapters of the Bible here. If you fast forward to the very end of the Bible, to Revelation, to the very end, what do you see? 
What do you see in the book of Revelation? You see a massive group of people from every tribe and tongue filling the earth, bearing God's image, singing his praise to his glory. Where are they doing it? In a garden city, a beautiful, structured, ordered, beautiful place filled with the image and the life of God. That's the, that's the, the end goal. That's where we're going. That's the, the journey to, to, to which we are heading. It's a beautiful, beautiful image. And you read right at the end, Revelation 22. Remember back in Genesis 2, we had the rivers flowing out of Eden. Well, you go and read Revelation 22, and it speaks about the river flowing out of the garden city. And on either side of the river, what is it? It's the other tree from the garden, the tree of life. And it says that the tree of life and the river flowing from it is bringing healing to the nations. Friends, that's the good news that we have for our world right now that is in chaos. We are meant to be bringing about beauty, image, order, and life that overflows to the glory of Yahweh. And Jesus Christ has made it possible for that to happen again. Maybe you are just asking here, well, what are some next steps? Because this has stirred my heart and I've got a clear vision now. What are some practical next steps maybe I can get about doing tonight or tomorrow? Well, here's an idea. Why don't you literally sit down with your calendar, with your diary, look at your week and see how your week has already been set out to be the solution to tohu and bohu. How are you meant to be bringing about order and structure and definition, bringing order out of chaos? And how are you meant to be and what are the opportunities for bringing the image of God and the life of God to full fruition. And why don't you look at your diary, involve leaders, involve other life group members, chat about how you can do this well to the glory of Yahweh. How can you be going about being the solution to tohu and bohu to the glory of God? That would be my suggestion to you. And for those of you who have been joining us today and you've been listening along and you've realized today, wow, I'd never heard this before. I'd never considered that this is the purpose and the meaning of life. And you realize I need the restoration work of God in my life in order to be going about this, in order to be actually glorifying Yahweh because I haven't been glorifying Yahweh with my, with my life. The next step for you is two simple words that are found all over the New Testament. Repent and believe. Repent and believe. Repent means turn away from your old life, your life of glorifying yourself and not Yahweh. Turn away from that and turn to Jesus in faith and trust that what he did on the cross for you is enough to restore you to God, to restore your relationship with God, to allow the Holy Spirit to make you a new creation and you will now be set off on a new trajectory to bring glory to Yahweh as you go about bringing beauty, order and the image of God and the life of God to the world around us. Have a fantastic week.